Hi, I'm Philippe de Rijk, and I'm a security expert helping developers build secure, complex applications. I often deal with OAuth and OpenID Connect and get a lot of questions on how to secure these technologies in modern applications. And that's exactly why Fusion Auth invited me to give a talk on the insecurity of OAuth in front-end web applications. In this talk, we're going to talk about challenges with securing front-ends. I'm going to give you some examples and demos of real attack scenarios. And of course, we're going to talk about solutions on securing OAuth in front-end web applications. But before we do that, let's take a step back and talk about the history of OAuth 2 for a second. OAuth 2, the official specification, the RFC, was published as a full RFC in 2012. That's a long time ago. Back then, we were building mostly backend web applications, a web app that runs on an application server and can run an OAuth flow with an authorization server. That's what the traditional authorization code flow was intended to support. And of course, we also have mobile apps and front-end apps, but to be honest, they, they have been kind of a side note for a while and nobody really considered them to be important. Of course, we all know how history went. Mobile apps became kind of important and they are a first-class citizen in any OAuth app deployment today. Mobile apps, there's a specific specification, an additional RFC, giving guidelines on how to implement OAuth securely in a mobile application. And a similar mechanism or a similar uh, pattern happened for front-end web applications. They used to use the implicit flow, but with the rise of Angular apps, React apps, Vue apps, and all of these JavaScript-based front-ends, they have become first-class citizens as well. There's a spec, it's not a finalized spec, but there's a draft RFC um, stating what the best practices are for browser-based applications. And that's going to be the focus for this presentation here today. We're going to talk about front-ends and how to use OAuth in a front-end and also how to break OAuth in front-ends. When you talk about front-end web applications, we're talking about JavaScript applications. And when you talk about JavaScript, especially JavaScript in the browser, you also have to talk about malicious JavaScript. One of the main threats against front-end web applications is the inadvertent execution of malicious JavaScript code. What does that mean? It means that the, that the application is running in the browser and the attacker manages to insert code into the application, usually at runtime, triggering the execution of that malicious code inside the application's runtime. How does that happen? Well, there's a couple of ways that this can happen. Let's, let's walk over three different options. Number one, the attacker could compromise one of the packages that, is that are used by the application, a dependency. If they compromise an NPM package, the code gets built into the application and, of course, executes every time the application executes. Option number two, the application often loads remote code files as well. Using a script tag with a source attribute and reload a code file from a server, if the attacker compromises one of these code files, it will be included in the application and the malicious code will execute. And option number three is cross-site scripting. In a cross-site scripting attack, or XSS, the attacker basically provides data to the application and the application accidentally executes part of that data as code. That's essentially what a cross-site scripting attack is all about and that is the main threat against front-end web applications today. Here's a, a graph from HackerOne, a bug bounty platform. It's from a couple of years ago. But they looked at the categories of uh, reported vulnerabilities and cross-site scripting was the biggest one that they had. 23% of vulnerabilities were about cross-site scripting. And this is not a new revelation. This is not earth-shocking information like, oh my God, we didn't know about that. This is something that everybody who's involved with security is well aware of. All the guidelines talk about cross-site scripting. And even that specification I mentioned, the OAuth browser-based apps best practices, talks about the risk of cross-site scripting. Talks about cross-site scripting as a dangerous attack factor that we absolutely have to take into account when building front-end web applications. And that brings me to a very first takeaway in this session, and that is that malicious JavaScript remains a top threat. Whenever you're building a front-end web application, you have to ensure that you don't have the execution of malicious JavaScript, that you are using secure dependencies, that you reduce the amount of remote code files you include, and that you solve cross-site scripting in your code. Unfortunately, history has also taught us that while you can do everything in your power to stop 
the execution of malicious JavaScript or prevent the execution of malicious JavaScript, chances are that something is going to go wrong at some point in time. That's just the nature of the game. So the question that brings that, that arises here is then, what does that mean for your OAuth tokens? If malicious JavaScript executes in that front-end app, what is the impact? What are the consequences? To answer that question, let's so go back to that specification. The best practices for browser-based applications talks about cross-site scripting. That's the same quote as before. And it says like, yeah, because of cross-site scripting, there's a risk of token exfiltration. That's a very specific consequence of that malicious JavaScript executing in the app. So what is token exfiltration all about? Let's walk through an example here to explain token exfiltration in practice. All right, what we have on the left is my training application, Restograde. Restograde is a restaurant review app, very conceptually easy. Everybody knows how the restaurant reviews work, whether you're using TripAdvisor or Yelp or Google reviews, it's all the same. And restaurant reviews, whatever. I'm not going to talk about the concept, the contents of the application. We're going to talk about OAuth in that app. How do you implement OAuth typically in such an application? Well, you run an authorization code flow, which I'm not going to dive into detail here. But at the end of that flow, you receive tokens. And the application has to store those tokens somewhere. And very often that's done in a storage area in the browser, such as local storage or session storage or index DB. Tokens are stored there. The application can retrieve them when necessary, include them on a request to an API, and all seems to be working quite nicely. That's the setup. That's how we build that application. All right. What happens when malicious JavaScript code executes? Well, that code runs inside the application. Let's say that the attacker has created a review for a restaurant in town, submitted that, and I'm visiting that page. That code, that review is loaded in the application. Something goes wrong, and all of a sudden, malicious code executes in my browser on my machine inside the Restograde application. What can that code do? Well, that code runs inside the application. It can now read those storage areas. The attack here is token exfiltration. So the attacker is going to read that storage area, discover tokens there like, ooh, there's an access token here. Awesome. It's going to send that access token to a remote server controlled by the attacker. Access token is sent off. On that server controlled by the attacker, the request comes in saying like, hey, here's Philippe's access token. The attacker is now going to use that access token to contact the rest of great APIs in my name. That's essentially the attack scenario of token exfiltration. And this means that the attacker now has the power to impersonate me. As far as the API is concerned, the attacker is now me, and they can create additional reviews, they can modify my existing reviews, they can delete stuff, whatever the API allows them to do with that access token. This token exfiltration attack is mentioned in that browser-based best practices specification, and it's not a new attack scenario. It's not something that we didn't think of, not some new revelation. It's something that we're well aware of. And there's actually a bunch of guidelines against token exfiltration attacks to try and minimize the impact. That's why one of the guidelines is keep your access tokens short-lived. Because if an access token is only valid for 5 or 10 minutes and somebody steals it, then the abuse, the window of abuse, is limited to 5 or 10 minutes, depending on the lifetime of the token and how long it has been around. And that means that the access token becomes less powerful, less valuable when stolen. In an OAuth flow, we also have refresh tokens. Nowadays, when you run an authorization code flow with Pixie in the, with a the front-end app, you can also get a refresh token. Refresh tokens are about long-lived access and allow the client to get a fresh access token. So if those are stolen, that's a bigger problem. Because that refresh token allows the attacker to obtain fresh access tokens over and over again. And to counter that threat, the specification recommends the use of refresh token rotation. Refresh token rotation is about preventing the use or reuse of stolen refresh tokens. I'm going to dive a bit into detail on how refresh token rotation works in practice. Let me walk you through a timeline. The legitimate scenario of how refresh token rotation is supposed to work. So we have the application, uh, our application Restograde, obtaining tokens with an authorization code flow. And it obtains an access token, AT1, and a refresh token, RT1. And AT1 expires, let's say, in 10 minutes. So after 9 minutes, the application is aware, like, oh, my token is about to expire. 
I should probably get a fresh one. And the application is going to use a refresh token with a refresh token flow, contact the authorization server with RT1 in this case. The authorization server will make all the checks and like, oh yeah, this, this seems to be valid. Here's a fresh access token and also a fresh refresh token. So the application receives access token to AT2 and refresh token to RT2. And AT2 is valid for 10 minutes. So after nine minutes, the application is like, oh crap, my access token is going to expire. I'd better get a new one. And it's going to use refresh token to the receive access token tree and refresh token tree. And nine minutes later, you can see where this is going, right? Nine minutes later, the same process. And we receive token, access token four and refresh token four, five, six, and so on, and so on. I ran out of room on my slide, so I'm going to stop here with that whole chain. So that's refresh token rotation. Every time we use a refresh token, we get a fresh one. We rotate that token. Refresh token rotation is one part of the solution. There's a second part. And that second part is the responsibility of the authorization server, because the authorization server has to detect when a refresh token is used twice. So let me use that same timeline with an attack scenario now. The application shown here in that darkish blue color is just doing its thing. Access token one and refresh token one, use refresh token one to get token set two and so on and so on. And at some point that malicious review loads in my browser and the attacker steals refresh token two, ships it off to their server and it's like, ooh, we have a refresh token, awesome. And the attacker is using that refresh token and they will receive access token tree and refresh token tree. Which is, of course, that's kind of the goal for the attacker. It's like, yes, we have an access token and they can start creating crap reviews in my name on the Restrograde API. And when the access token would expire, they could use RT3 to get four uh, access token four and refresh token four and so on and so on. But the application here is unaware that this happened. Kind of the whole point of the attack, the application is just doing its thing and not aware that it has been attacked and the tokens have been exfiltrated. So at some point in time, the application is like, oh, it's time to get fresh tokens and it's going to use refresh token too. And the authorization server is going to be like, what? What are you doing? I've already used, saw refresh token too. You already did this. This makes no sense. And the assumption is if this happens, somebody else has used refresh token too. And we're dealing with a stolen token scenario, token exfiltration scenario, and we have to stop this. So the authorization server here will not issue new tokens. It will actually revoke all the tokens that have descended from RT2 in the past. So refresh token three, four, five, six, whatever, they'll all be revoked and both the application and the attacker lose access. That's the premise of refresh token rotation. Brings us to an important question. So refresh token rotation is awesome, allows us to detect when a refresh token is used more than once and consider that to be malicious behavior. But what if a stolen token is never used twice? Then the whole mechanism kind of doesn't do anything because it actually relies on seeing a token twice at the authorization server. So how could that happen? Let's, let's walk through a scenario here. Same setup, we have our application, we have our malicious code stealing tokens, shipping them off to the server of the attacker, and then the attacker just waits. Instead of being kind of a, an idiot, I would say, kind of a naive attacker, they're not going to be like, oh yeah, tokens, I'm going to use them. The attacker is aware of refresh token rotation and knows that if they do that, everything is going to blow up and the attack will not succeed in the way that they want it to succeed. So they just wait. They steal the tokens and they wait. And the attacker waits until the application goes offline. They can monitor that, like with a heartbeat or a close monitor or whatever. And when the application disappears, that probably means that the user has closed the application, has shut their laptop, went into airplane mode if you're traveling, whatever. It means that the application, the legitimate app, is not there to use the latest refresh token. So at that point, the attacker is like, awesome, now it's my turn. And the attacker uses the latest refresh token with the authorization server. The authorization server will check it, be like, yeah, that seems to be valid. Here's access token 19 and refresh token 19. And the attacker can later exchange refresh token 19 for token set 20 and 21 and 22 and so on. And the main takeaway here for this image, for this slide, is that token exfiltration attacks severely underrepresent the capabilities of malicious JavaScript. 
They are the equivalent of a script kitty attack. Because yes, we've seen these attacks in the past, where malicious code executes, they steal all the data, and they just use it in a very naive and careless way. But a real attacker, a skilled attacker, is not going to be that clumsy, I would say. A skilled attacker that knows about OAuth, that knows about refresh token rotation, is going to set up this very nuanced and um, sophisticated attack. And they might do something like this. And the real takeaway is that the attacker can do anything that a legitimate application can do. So if your application, if you as a front-end developer can make your application behave smartly, the attacker can write code that does exactly the same. They can monitor behavior, they can see what you're doing, they can wait for things, they can even steal tokens, remove your tokens, and then start using the other ones. Then you can't reuse your tokens as well. So there's a whole bunch of different attack scenarios that will ensure that a refresh token is never used twice. And I know that showing this on a slide is like, yeah, yeah, whatever. Visuals on slides are nice if you want to look at, uh, <laughs> at pretty images, but a real-world demo is often much more effective because it actually shows this pattern in action. And that's what we're going to do next. I'm going to walk you through refresh token rotation. I'm going to show you how an attacker can bypass that. All right, let's take a look at our demo application. So what we have in the demo application is I have a retrograde app. Um, disclaimer, I'm not a great designer, so it looks like absolute crap, but the demo uh, does work, so don't worry about that. So here's our uh, retrograde application. Like I said, it looks like crap and it doesn't do much, but um, we're not authenticated. We have a login, logout button, whatever. Um, it's just a simple application. All right, what does the application do? Well, it has a search feature, like so many applications. If you can search for something, um, it will tell you like, hey, you searched for something, something, and we couldn't find anything. So let's um, take an example here and search for something. That search parameter is often present in the URL. So here's an example, we search for test. If we search for test, the application loads and it says your search results for test. Nothing, okay. It doesn't search anything, it's whatever. It's just a simple demo. But that's kind of the, uh, that's our gateway because the parameter from here ends up in the page here. And if we provide a parameter that contains some JavaScript code, it's gonna end up in the page there and the browser might execute it. That's going to be our attack scenario. All right, let's, uh, before we attack the application, let's log in. Here's, um, our Restorgate login uh, page. It's using OAuth behind the scenes. It's an OAuth flow username password. I'm just gonna move forward and we will be logged in as Philip Dirac. Very simple, very straightforward. You will also see uh, in the DevTools at in a minute that we are using a refresh token and exchanging that for token. So obtain new refresh token. That means that the application is running a refresh token flow with a refresh token, obtains fresh tokens, uh, and it does that every couple of seconds. I reduce the lifetime of my refresh token to make this visible. Usually you would not do that every 10 or 20 seconds. You would do that in a slower rate. All right, that's the setup that we have right here. On to our attack. For our attack, I have prepared a malicious server. So I have a malicious server running um, to receive our tokens. And I also have an attack script that we're gonna inject. And the attack script is super straightforward. This is stealing tokens. What does it do? Um, this is what we insert into the retrograde application. It basically has a function steal data, which will call my malicious server running on malicious food. I'm a foodie, so I like uh, food-based demos. So this is malicious food. That's my evil server. Um, and we will send that uh, session storage data right there. That's essentially how we extract that information. We insert this and we do it every X seconds and X is three years. So every three seconds we'll steal tokens and send them off to our server. How do we inject that? Well, here's the payload. That's how we search for test. And this is how we search for test and insert some malicious code. So we'd ask the browser like, yeah, can you show us an SVG image? And when it loads, uh, create a script element and load it from maliciousfood.com. That's what the attacker does. So this is the link I would send to my victims and they would load that in their browsers. All right, let's become the victim here. We click on a link provided by the attacker. We open that in the application. You can see that we're still logged in, single sign-on. Uh, Philippe Dijk is still there. Um, everything is good. And you can see on the right, that's my server here, that we obtained a refresh token. We haven't used it. We just stole it. 
You can see on the left that we have re stole, uh, received a new refresh token, refresh token rotation and action. And on the right, we steal that refresh token. And we also have a heartbeat mechanism. So the server of the attacker knows that the client is still alive, knows that the client is there and it's like, all right, I'm not doing anything, it's fine. All right, so let's kill the application here. Let's navigate away. That means that the script is no longer running. It's no longer sending tokens. You can see that in the output on the right. Not, nothing is received. So after a certain timeout, the server of the attacker knows like, okay, the application is not there anymore. Awesome, now it's our turn. And you can see right here that they're using or abusing that refresh token, the latest one and they get a fresh access token and a fresh refresh token. And the attacker is, is doing that continuously. I'm gonna kill this because otherwise <laughs> the server is not gonna get very happy. But the attacker has now the power to keep that token chain alive until the refresh token hits a final expiry date. And that is a way to sidestep refresh token rotation. Refresh token rotation was used, but was never triggered to stop this attack from happening. And that brings us to a second takeaway in this presentation. And that takeaway is that refresh token rotation is not really a security measure. Because malicious JavaScript is actually more dangerous than often assumed. A sophisticated attacker can easily sidestep refresh token rotation. And that means that just relying on this is not going to be a good practice. And that's a contradiction to what the spec actually says, because the specification highly recommends the use or mandates the use of refresh token rotation and considers that to be enough to stop attacks like this. But I've shown you in practice with a demo that it's really very easy to bypass in practice. And it's actually a bit worse because if you look at that specification, the OAuth for browser-based apps, they talk about token exfiltration a lot. They are very focused on preventing an attacker from stealing the tokens of an application. There's even a whole bunch of patterns that you can use to hide tokens inside the application. Like, yeah, you can use a web worker and put the tokens in there and then the attacker can't access the tokens and they can't exfiltrate the tokens and so on. And that's true, but irrelevant. Stopping token exfiltration is irrelevant because the next attack pattern I'm gonna show you doesn't touch the application's tokens at all. The next attack pattern is even more sophisticated and basically says like, yeah, the application can have its tokens. I don't care. I'm just going to get my own tokens. And we'll end up with two independent sets of tokens. So how does that work? Let me walk you through that scenario. The setup is the same. We have our rest -grade application. We have our application's SDK obtaining tokens and doing whatever it needs to do. So you can even hide the tokens in an unaccessible place for all we care. Doesn't matter. Our malicious code is inserted into the page and will perform certain steps in the attack scenario. And step one is it will, what it will, it will basically do is it will run a new OAuth flow silently in the background to obtain a fresh set of tokens. And to do that, we set up a listener. We set up a listener to receive a, an iframe based web message. And then we start a new OAuth flow in an iframe. This is something that's supported by all browsers by all authorization servers, it's a way to obtain tokens silently in the background if the user is already logged in. The demo app I showed you before was actually relying on this in a legitimate use case. That's why whenever we relo reload the app, it knows who we are because it runs such a silent flow in an iframe. And now the attacker does the same. The attacker runs that silent flow. The browser includes a cookie there telling the authorization server who you are. That's your single sign on session that's present and the authorization server will just issue a new authorization code which can be exchanged for tokens. So the attacker steals that authorization code, ships it off to their malicious server and exchanges that authorization code for tokens with the authorization server. And in step five, the authorization server when exchanging that code believes that the attacker is the front-end application and will issue tokens in the name of the user of that application, the victim. And this new set of tokens is completely independent from the application's tokens. So the application has a refresh token and the attacker has a completely different refresh token. They're unrelated, there's no relationship, there's no reuse and the whole refresh token rotation mechanism is not even going to be involved in this scenario. So let's take a look at what that means in practice. Let me start the demo. So it's the same kind of setup. We have a malicious server. We have our front-end application. What we're gonna do in this application 
let me um, already load it. It still works. We have that single sign on. That's basically that silent iframe based flow the application is using for legitimate purposes to reestablish who we are. In our attack scenario, we have a new attack.js script. This one is a bit more complicated because we're now running a fully independent OAuth flow. So let me start at the beginning. We have um, our message listener. So we set up that message uh, listener and we say like whenever there's a message, handle the uh, call this function, which will basically steal the authorization code if it's a valid one and send it off to our evil server. That's essentially what we are doing. All right. What else? After five seconds, we run our silent flow. So we inject the, uh, the code, we wait a bit, and then we run our flow. And this is the run flow. We basically construct an OAuth URL with uh, all the parameters that we need to make it work. Um, and we insert that in an iframe. So we insert an iframe into the page. We set this URL as a source. It will send a request with a cookie. The authorization server is like, oh, I know who you are. Here's uh, the authorization code. And we steal that code and exchange it for tokens later. All right. The exchange, can you can see that in our server code. So here we accept incoming data. So we basically receive that authorization code um, and we use it uh, here. And using it basically means we go back to the authorization server, sorry, back to the authorization server and ask it to exchange that code for tokens. That's the token endpoint and we receive an access token and a refresh token. All right, that's a setup. Let's see this in action. The payload to get all of this started is the same. We still, uh, we restarted our server, so we have a different attack.js. So we still load that SVG, load that attack file, insert it into the application and see what happens. All right, here we go. You can see that the app is running its refresh token rotation chain uh, just like before. Nothing is happening. Nothing special is happening there. That's just uh, best practices. And you can also see on the right that we have stolen the authorization code. You can see here that we have extracted an authorization code. We're exchanging that code for tokens, receive an access token and a refresh token. And from that point on, the attacker can use refresh token rotation to just keep uh, getting new tokens for that user. And you can see that the application is doing the same at the same time because these token sets are independent. They're basically not related and the, attack, the attacker's tokens are independent from the application's tokens. And that shows you that token exfiltration is not really the problem because we haven't exfiltrated tokens from the application itself. We have just requested fresh tokens and decided to abuse those. That's essentially what's going on in this attack pattern. All right, this attack scenario is very, very inconvenient. Because this attack scenario basically means that whenever we're running OAuth in a front-end application, the attacker can always run their own flow and sidestep all of the security measures that we have built into our application. Because the attacker doesn't even touch the application. All the attacker needs is code running inside the application's origin, inside this app.resticway.com domain, to ensure that they can receive the authorization code from the silent flow, and that's it. And when that happens, it's game over, basically. And you'll find people trying to argue that we can secure this. There's a lot of work going on on a proof of possession mechanism for applications. So not using MTLS, but using JSON web tokens to prove that you possess a secret when you're using an access token. It's called DPOP, Demonstration of Proof of Possession. And DPOP does not help at all in this scenario. Because if the application is using DPOP, it will stop token exfiltration, sure. But the attacker can always request fresh tokens, provide their own DPOP secret, and sidestep that mechanism that way as well. And the takeaway here is that you can't really secure browser-only flows. And that's not a very popular takeaway, but it's the truth. The security of OAuth flows in the browser, relies on controlling the origin of that redirect URI, and it allows you to read a response and extract whatever you are extracting right here. And when the attacker controls that origin, it's basically game over. Even a proof of possession mechanism can't really save you to stop an attack like this. Brings us to a question. So what do we do then? What's the solution here? And the solution is a bit unfortunate, but it basically means when you build a single page application, it's always recommended to include a backend component to simplify the handling of OAuth. 
One pattern is very straightforward, works really well in an application where you control all the components. If you have or building the application, enterprise apps or single isolated apps, you can build your front end with a back end and essentially handle tokens on the back end component. So the front end and the back end belong together here. The front end can start the authorization code flow, but in essence, the authorization code will be sent to a back end component, which exchanges it for tokens. The tokens now live on the back end, but in this scenario, the back end includes the tokens in an HTTP only cookie and sends them back to the browser. HTTP only cookies are not accessible to JavaScript. HTTP only cookies are one of the only places where malicious JavaScript cannot read the data or extract the data. So in this sense, the cookie the tokens are stored in a somewhat secure location. And when the API, the front end wants to make API calls, they can call the backend and the browser will automatically include that cookie, allowing the backend to extract the tokens from that cookie, inspect the access token, decide like, yeah, I want to handle this request, yes or no, and basically move forward. And the, the change here, the benefit is that the cookie is handled automatically by the browser. Application code has no access to those cookies. There's no way for application code to read the value of the cookie, to read the value of the response containing the cookies, and that reduces the exposure. So this kind of addresses that token exfiltration attack. This also works quite well against our attack scenario from before, because the authorization code is sent to a backend component and not to the frontend app. So even if the attacker would be there, they can't extract the authorization code and they can't basically steal that information. There's one limitation with this scenario, there's one very specific use case, and that's called a first party scenario. First party scenario meaning that you control the front end and the back end so you can set up this pattern. This is a non standard uh, OAuth deployment, but once, if you have software that supports that, like Fusion Auth, you can easily set it up like this. All right. I can hear you thinking, like, hmm, that sounds kind of nice because of the security benefits, but what about that malicious code? What if the attacker compromises the front end? Don't we still have a problem there? Like, this doesn't really solve the execution of malicious JavaScript, now does it? And that would be a very correct observation. This does not solve the execution of malicious JavaScript, but it reduces the consequences. But if something goes bad and the attacker can still execute that malicious JavaScript code, we still have the same problem, and the attacker can still manipulate the front-end application. Like before, the attacker can do stupid, silly attacks like token exfiltration, but there's nothing to extract, so that's not really an issue. But the attacker can still impersonate the user to the backend, and the browser will include that cookie, and the backend will be none the wiser. And that's, again, a very well-known attack pattern called session writing, and it has been around since, basically since we have cookie-based session management. That's why preventing cross-site scripting or preventing the execution of malicious JavaScript code in your application is very, very important. All right, the takeaway for this pattern is that you can prevent token theft with HTTP-only cookies if you involve a backend component and deploy this in a first-party scenario. That's where this is going to work really well, um, and that's a very important use case for these kinds of applications. We can take this pattern and generalize it a bit. And that brings us back to one of the recommendations in that OAuth spec for browser-based applications, and also to the industry best practice for deploying this in a generic way across various domains and also in third-party scenarios. And that's the use of a backend for frontend or BFF. And to talk about the BFF, let me first sketch the landscape that we had before, before we start fixing this. Before we had a frontend running an authorization code flow, obtains access tokens and refresh tokens, and then makes API calls. The whole problem with this flow is that there's no client authentication, meaning if the attacker controls the frontend, they can impersonate the frontend in that authorization code flow, which results in the ability to obtain a fresh set of tokens. That was the most advanced attack scenario we talked about uh, earlier in this session. How do we fix that with a BFF? Well, we kind of apply the same pattern as before, but in a more generic way. We now build a backend component called the backend for frontend, and that backend component doesn't, do, doesn't really do anything except run our OAuth flows. We make that backend 
a confidential OAuth client, so it now runs the authorization code flow with client authentication. It has a client ID and a client secret or key-based authentication, and it authenticates when exchanging an authorization code or exchanging a refresh token. Our front-end doesn't do any OAuth at all. We rip out the full uh, OAuth features from our front-end. It only calls our BFF. And whenever it wants to call an external API, the front-end asks the BFF, hey man, I want to call this API. Can you make that happen? The cookie will be there. In that cookie will be tokens. The BFF extracts the tokens from the cookies, adds them to the outgoing request to the API. That's step number three on the slide here. API will process the request, authorization header, bearer, access token, and so on. Send a response to the BFF, which proxies the response back to the front end. And that's a more generic pattern that works uh, even across different domains. Of course, the front end and the BFF, they belong together. That's why it's called the backend for front end. It's not just a backend, it's a backend for this specific front end. And they would typically be deployed in the same domain to have that cookie based support. All right, let me quickly walk you through what it means to in your architecture to implement that BFF. Because it looks like, oh crap, I have to change everything about my application, but it's really not that bad. So let's, let's walk through this. One of the first things that changes is we can remove OAuth functionality from the front-end app. Our front-end is no longer an OAuth client application. Our BFF will be that. So we move that responsibility to the BFF. The only thing the front-end does is check if there's a session and then send API calls. That's it. Very simple, very straightforward. The APIs, which are often external APIs, which you have no control over, that's good news in this case, because we don't have to change anything. When the BFF sends a request to the API, it will be a traditional API call with an authorization header and so on. Nothing has to change on that end. That's good. On the authorization server, well, we are using standard OAuth features, so nothing really has to change except some configuration change. Instead of marking the client as a public client without a secret, we will mark our client application as a confidential client, so we'll have a secret, but that's about it. Everything else is standard OAuth, supported by all types of authorization servers out there. And then the only thing where there's some lifting going on, some work going on, is the BFF. There's no business logic there, but the BFF is now an OAuth client, so it runs an OAuth or OpenID Connect flow. These are, again, standard OAuth features, you'll find plenty of backend libraries for the language you're using that will support an OAuth authorization code flow. Second piece of lifting on the BFF, the second piece of responsibility is the proxying of API calls, which basically means the BFF has a certain set of endpoints and maps them to remote API endpoints. Request comes in, BFF reads the cookie, looks up the tokens either in a server-side session or from the, the cookies themselves, that's perfectly possible as well, slaps the cookie on the outgoing request to the API and sends a response back. Many languages like .NET and, uh, and Node.js and whatever, they have um, libraries, proxy libraries that you can readily use for this, so you don't even have to implement all of this yourself. So all in all, BFF, not that big of an impact on your architecture. And that leaves us with one thing to discuss, what about that malicious JavaScript in a front-end application? What if the attacker compromises our front-end even with the BFF? We haven't really solved that problem now, have we? And the answer is no, we haven't. Cross-site scripting or malicious JavaScript remains a massive problem and it still allows the attacker to perform session writing attacks. It still allows the attacker to send requests to our BFF, which will send them to the API in the name of the user. Again, that's why it's so important to solve cross-site scripting in your applications. However, and that's going to be my final point here. However, that BFF gives you a little bit more control than what usually is the case in the presence of malicious JavaScript. For example, if the BFF only exposes five out of the 25 API endpoints to this particular front end, then the attacker will only be able to call those five endpoints, even though theory, if you would have an access token, you would call all 25. We don't have an access token. We only have a cookie. So the attacker can only call what the BFF allows the front end to call. That is a restriction that might be very useful in certain highly security sensitive applications. And then the second point is the BFF sees all the requests from the front end pass by. So you could use a BFF as kind of a additional protection mechanism. You could do things like rate limiting on the BFF, 
or a specific front end. Like, hey, you can request 10 documents per minute. That's kind of sensible, but 10,000, let's, let's not support that. Or you could do anomaly detection, like, hey, this traffic pattern doesn't match anything we've ever seen. Like, let's not allow that and let's stop this from uh, abusing our APIs and so on and so on. So it gives you a point of control where you could implement these additional policies, but they're not necessary to benefit from BFF uh, to secure tokens. And that brings us to the last takeaway here. A BFF significantly increases security. This is rapidly becoming a best practice for implementing security sensitive OAuth web applications. They're being used in financial applications, banking apps, e-health apps. They're built as SPA, single page apps, but they don't handle tokens in the browser. They delegate that responsibility to the BFF. And to be completely fair to the browser-based app specification, they mentioned the backend for front-end pattern in that spec as well. It's mentioned um, very briefly. Um, the spec is not really convinced that this is a good solution because they prefer to have a front-end only solution. But with what we talked about here, we have proven and shown that this is not going to result in a secure implementation. Just to give you the full picture and to be completely fair to the spec authors as well. All right, so what are some of the key takeaways in this presentation? First of all, securing OAuth in the browser alone is not possible. Without any backend component, you cannot secure OAuth in the browser. This may not be a bad thing. This is, may not be a showstopper. If you think this is acceptable for a not very sensitive application, then by all means, go for it. But if you're building something sensitive, financial, e-health, highly sensitive personal information, this is not good enough and you need to involve a backend component. With that backend component, we can reduce the impact, the consequences of an attack, of an attack to session writing. And that's the, that's the limit. You can't go above session writing because session writing will always be there the moment the attacker controls the client-side application. And that is our segue into the third takeaway, you have to solve cross-site scripting in your applications. And the only way to effectively do that is by following secure coding guidelines. There's plenty of advice out there uh, about securing Angular apps and React apps and Vue apps. So study that advice, figure out how to do that, and make sure you get it right. And with that, I want to thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this presentation. If you want to learn a bit more about Fusion Art or some other uh, content about authentication and authorization, check out these references here and have a nice day.